Um, I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourselves at the beginning of your presentation briefly. I will give you, I said five minutes, but I will give you five minutes and 30 seconds because uh, sometimes there's a slight delay between when I advance something and when you guys actually see it. When you have one minute left, I will be making that sound. When you have no minutes left, I will be advancing to the next person's slide. And the way that you know that you're up next is that you will see your name. So we're going to do, um, I had given you the order beforehand, but I think there's a set of four presentations and then we're going to take a slight break so people can ask questions and then we'll start again. Okay. Presenters, do you have any questions for me before we start? Go ahead and unmute and ask if you have any. Going once, going twice. Okay. So, Rick, you can get us started. And oh, you have me going first, huh? Yep. So, <laughs> alrighty. So your time starts now. Okay. Hey, folks, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Breck Bowden. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the, the director of the Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Um, and I wanted to tell you about uh, several initiatives that we have going. Uh, next slide. Um, so the first of these is a visualization tool to uh, communicate riverine erosion hazards uh, for the purposes of, Im of improving uh, flood resiliency in our area. The motivating factor for this uh, was really uh, tremendous vulnerability that we found after Tropical Storm Irene in, in 2011. And an observation that had occurred uh, a few years before of, of just how important uh, stream bank erosion was as a source of phosphorus to Lake Champlain and therefore uh, support of harmful algal blooms. Uh, the state uh, of Vermont had developed a state-of-the-art stream geomorphic assessment database. And uh, this team led by Kristen Underwood uh, at the University of Vermont identified a set of 15 parameters that explained six different erosion uh, regime classes and then developed this quantitative tool that would allow us to allow communities to classify the potential for sediment erosion and deposition. Uh, they developed a map and, and tool that they used for outreach to uh, community, state, and federal uh, officials, and it's uh, catching uh, quite a bit of attention. Next slide. A second related initiative was a uh, watershed scorecard um, approach for flood hazard uh, improvement. This was basically using a, uh, a community-based social marketing approach in which we were trying to identify desirable behaviors for change and then market ways that you could promote that behavior change in the future. So. Um, uh, Chris Stepanuk, uh, who's the extension leader in our group, and several of her colleagues uh, produced maps that were summarized that summarized the level of flood preparedness for different communities. So each community could see who was upstream of them that might affect them, and who were they upstream of that they might affect uh, in the in the case of a flood. And so workshops were offered to inform these communities about various state and federal benefits that they might uh, be eligible for uh, if they invoke several different levels or, or types of river protection. And that's led to enhanced protection in several communities. Next slide, please. Um, we have been involved in public outreach for an important uh, international joint commission study of uh, Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River, where there have been historic, historically, there have been uh, uh, difficult flooding issues. Most of Lake Champlain lies in the US, but the Richelieu River, which is the main connection to the St. Lawrence River and the main egress from Lake Champlain, um, is entirely in, in Canada. And there's been longstanding tensions regarding who is responsible for flood uh, issues that have occurred there uh, uh, regularly in, in the past. Was it U.S. land management practices that were causing damage in, in Canada, uh, or, um, or was it Canadian management of riparian areas along the Richelieu uh, River or some combination? So Lake Champlain Sea Grant staff served as uh, on the public advisory group for this study, producing several fact sheets that debunked 
a number of persistent myths about flooding in the area and created useful summaries to explain available decision support tools and the various strengths and weaknesses of alternative BMPs. Next slide, please. Uh, second to last slide here, uh, some important programming regarding natural assets management. Uh, two initiatives here, um, a, a watershed forestry partnership that we've developed. About 80% of the Lake Champlain region is forested. Uh, forests have low phosphorus delivery uh, loading to, to Lake Champlain, but it's a big area, and so it creates unexpectedly high loads of phosphorus to the lake. So better forest management is, is needed. Uh, so we've created a new multi-partner initiative um, that is uh, uh, in which we're reaching out to uh, communities and landowners about best management practices, primarily for riparian management. Uh, also a green infrastructure collaborative to manage, to help people understand operations and maintenance alternatives for runoff from developed lands. And finally, um, last slide, please. Uh, several programs that we offer for outreach to home and landowners about how they can manage stormwater personally on their property. So dealing with uh, or helping to educate real estate agents, we actually, they can get professional credits for taking our workshops regarding property management to reduce stormwater and then direct outreach uh, through a couple of programs to give them education. Thanks. So, um, thank you. So, Roy, you are up next, and we will have a chance for questions in just a minute. Okay, Roy, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Roy Woodrig with New York Sea Grant. I am the Great Lakes Coastal Processes and Hazard Specialist, and today we'll be talking about New York Sea Grant's resiliency efforts in the Great Lakes, and I'll also be talking on behalf of Mary Osterman, who's our Community Resilience Specialist. Next slide. We'll start with the Coastal Resilience Index, and this is a 44-page document for community resilience and self-assessment for Great Lakes communities. This includes a nine-page exercise to investigate coastal hazard vulnerabilities across multiple different community sectors and provides a bit of a um, scenario planning for the communities so they can educate themselves on what they might be lacking for uh, resiliency planning. The questions posed within the document are simple yes no format, uh, most of them at least, uh, aim to guide discussions within the community about their resilience to coastal hazards. This could, uh, this could be blizzards, it could be a station on Lake Erie, there's quite a few different scenarios that are planned uh, within this document itself. Ideally, it's designed to be a lightweight um, approach to these things, uh, so we realize that a lot of our communities are staffed by uh, um, very few people. Sometimes the zoning assessor is in maybe once a week for four hours, so we want this to be something that's easily handleable, handleable by uh, smaller governments, uh, but can be scaled up to larger governments as well. Next slide, please. Um, we also, in 2018, started a uh, post-flood visioning workshops, and this was in, um, this is a partnership with Genesee Finger Lakes Regional Planning. And in 2017, and also later in 2019, the village of Sodas Point in Wayne County was hit exceptionally hard by Lake Ontario floods. And in order to avoid an, ex uh, an expensive, massive infrastructure rebuild for this tiny little peninsula with limited budget, um, created this workshop to uh, take a more local approach to address key priorities for promoting better community resilience and ecosystem integrity. So we didn't wanna wreck up the environment just for the sake of a few flooded streets. Um, the stakeholders were given a chance to give testimonials about the 2017 flood. We heard from, uh, you know, residents that were out on like the, the vaca vacation properties on, on the bay and um, also from the emergency managers that had to deal with and triage this event as, uh, as it unfolded. Uh, later in the afternoon, we uh, created breakout groups for economy and tourism, environment and infrastructure. Uh, and these groups talked through their priorities and delivered uh, action items to the village of Sotus Point and Wayne County. Next slide, please. 
Um, in 2020, the coronavirus pandemic hit New York State very hard. So we were very limited in our ability to travel out and uh, consult with property owners and residents about their flooding and erosion issues on Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Uh, as a result, we created a survey 123 form uh, where residents could actually report their shoreline erosion and flooding issues, request technical assistance from myself or engineers uh, that work in the area, discuss permitting options and, you know, um, how that whole process works, and um, connect the shoreline residents to shoreline contractors that are capable of doing the work. Incidentally, this actually tripled the amount of inquiries uh, that we would normally receive in a, uh, any given year, uh, which was pretty interesting since uh, it was actually a quiet year on Lake Ontario, the water levels were finally coming down a little bit. Um, but it also opened our eyes to certain erosion hazard hotspots on, on Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. You see the three rectangles that I have selected there. Uh, these were areas that just didn't receive a whole lot of attention in previous years. And we come to find out that even though they weren't in the press or making a big fuss about it, that these communities were actually struggling quite a bit from shoreline erosion. And in the bottom lower left, the southwest part of New York State and the northeast part of Lake Erie, uh, those all came in within a few weeks um, after November 14th of this year, which in which Lake Erie had a, um, a rather significant SAGE event. So we actually Notice there's quite a few communities that we could extend our research and outreach to that were previously being underserved. Next slide. Um, and this is more of just kind of a, an add on to a bunch of different programs, but we had some. Uh, this started out as an internal program through our omnibus, but actually turned into um, <laughs> uh, kind of a monitoring of all these resiliency projects that are going on on Lake Ontario. Um, in 2019, the governor announced the New York Ready, which is a $300 million worth of resiliency projects on the lake. And so far we have went out, we started doing drone monitoring and on the ground photo monitoring of these areas to uh, get an idea of how they change and how they actually respond to these natural resiliency measures that are going in place. Um, and you see in the bottom left corner, we actually caught an algal bloom the day that it happened this uh, July. Was it? And that's it. Cool. Thanks. So, Madison, you are up next. Whenever you're ready to go, let me know. Perfect. I'm ready. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to join you today. My name is Madison Rodman, and I'm a Resilience Extension Educator at Minnesota Sea Grant. I don't know many of you. I've been here about a year, um, but I'm excited to share with you today. Um, we had a handful of different projects that we could have talked about um, here at Minnesota Sea Grant, but I'm going to share one with you today, the new watershed game Coast Model. Um, I'm going to acknowledge first that this is, I'm just one member of a team of six involved with this project, and since we only have five minutes, I only can give you a tiny taste of um, this great tool. Next slide. So the watershed game was designed over 12 years ago and is in use um, in over 20 states. You might have played or facilitated it yourself. Um, if you're not too familiar with the watershed game, participants work together in land use teams around a large stylized watershed map like the one you see here. And as they play through the simulation, they learn um, about a variety of land uses and how they impact water resources, all while increasing their knowledge of best management practices um, and how choice, choices can reduce those adverse impacts. Here you see a version of our lake game. Next slide. The new model um, is situated well within this uh, established watershed game program, which includes, like you saw before, a lake model, a stream model, and a river model. Um, two years ago, feedback indicated that there's a need for a coastal version. Um, and after detailed review, a survey, and focus groups, um, we've written up a report, which I'll share um, later a link to. Um, but a new coast model for local leaders is one that we needed. Um, and we think about local leaders in our um, planning that as people that are elected and appointed officials, community leaders, watershed organizations, and adult audiences who have roles in developing plans, applying practices, and adopting policies um, integral to water resource management. So I'm going to share with you a few highlights of the COAST um, version. Next slide. 
So here is our Coast Model Game Board. Remember, this is supposed to be on a large table, um, and it's a fictional landscape, which contains a large river coming into our uh, community, along with several tributaries, um, natural areas, along with built up um, population centers, and a variety of coastal industries. We intended this landscape to be representative of a variety of coasts, both ocean and Great Lakes. And the ultimate goal of this game is similar to our previous versions. It's to use limited financial resources, just like real life, um, to reduce excess nitrogen, phosphorus, and or sediment um, to meet a clean water goal while improving your community's resilience to flooding. Uh, next slide. So here are five land uses in our game board. You see on the bottom left, we have an industrial port, an agricultural land use, an urban center, a residential and a rural coast. And during the game, each land use team uses their limited resources to play tool cards to reduce a pollutant of concern, all while increasing their resilience to flooding. At the same time, they do real life things like plan ahead, play, pay flood insurance, encounter unanticipated events such as severe storms and harmful algal blooms. And the final round of play um, requires participants to work cooperatively across land use teams to meet a clean water goal and collectively win the game. Next slide. So here are a uh, selection, we're zooming in on our rural coast land use, and I wanna show you a selection of two tool cards that you use to play the game. There are about 50 that we've developed. Um, so if you were playing this rural coast um, team, you'd have to choose between tools like these um, based on your funds, benefits, and feasibility. You can see that each tool card has a cost, um, how it reduces your pollutant of concern, and how it increases resilience in your community. And when you play these tool cards, you spend money um, to fix areas in your community. So if you see that support flood resilient retrofits tool card, you can apply it um, and you can see visually how um, you can fix up your community. Also on the back of each tool card is a plain language description of what kind of that tool is for our local leader audience. Next slide. So here is a selection of two other tool cards for our industrial port land use. You can see um, how they vary from our uh, rural coast. And just remember that during each the game, each land use has opportunities to play multiple of these. So we're about three depending on how the game um, unfolds. Next slide. So my time is running out and I can't show you um, more about the game. That would take a lot longer. But I just want you to know that this tool is one that I and the rest of that team that you saw earlier is really excited to roll out. Um, when we're completing our local leader version, um, that in-person version in the next couple weeks, um, but in the, into the future, into 2021, we're looking towards developing a classroom version of the Coast model. We'll be doing some training seminars and workshops, how to facilitate and play the game. And we're also beginning to scope out what it could look like in an online virtual format. Um, so please let me know if you'd like to be added to our email list and we'll share this um, game more broadly with you, or if you have um, experience in this digital world. So conver converting this in-person tool to a digital one, we have lots of questions, but it's very exciting. Um, next slide. So here is our full project team. Um, please don't hesitate to get in touch and send us any questions you have about this tool. Um, I'm gonna share these two links in the chat, both it's our link to our website and then our report about how we came up with um, the new model. So thanks again, and uh, I will um, pass it to the next presenter. Thank you. And um, so this is our last presenter before we will take a break for people to ask questions. Um, so Sarah, it's Sarah Stallman. Whenever you're ready to go, let me know. I'm ready, go ahead. Okie doke. All right, hi everyone. My name is Sarah Stallman. I am the extension leader for Pennsylvania Sea Grant and I'm going to be presenting on kind of the main project that we're working on in the Lake Erie watershed, which is preparing Erie for extreme weather, what to do and where to start. Next slide. Um, so we received a grant from Glisa, $20,000, um, to do this project. And we were really excited that we also received some local support, 5,000 from Erie Insurance, um, which is a local business. Um, we've used some funding from the Sea Grant visioning process, and we've also had a lot of, um, support, including in-kind support from, uh, the members of the Community Resilience Action Network of Erie or CRANE. Next slide. And um, so I, this, I just had to acknowledge all the partners that we have working on this project. I don't have enough time to go into exactly who we are and what we do, um, but we're a community-based group that focuses on building resilience in the Erie community. Next slide. 
so essentially for this project, um, we wanted to follow the steps that are outlined in the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, which is essentially exploring hazards, assessing vulnerabilities and risks, investigating options, planning, prioritizing, and taking action. Next slide. Kind of our first step um, is to explore Erie's hazards and assets. And so uh, originally we were planning on holding some public engagement workshops um, and then COVID happened as the project actually started in April. Um, so we've been doing a lot of planning and having discussions about, you know, do we wait to have these in person? Um, so we're kind of switching around what things are looking like. And, and I think we're gonna start out um, with a survey to ask our stakeholders about different climate change and weather risks that are important to them um, and what some of the hazards and assets that they're concerned mostly about. So looking at things like critical facilities and um, economic assets, vulnerable populations, um, public assets and historical considerations and really just getting a vibe from the community about what their greatest concerns are um, weather-wise and what the greatest assets are that are at risk within the community. Next slide. We've just seen this um, from Roy. So we're also kind of stealing the New York Coastal Resilience Index. Um, I've worked with Mary quite a bit and she's been super helpful on this project to help us move forward. Um, and so we're going to be essentially conducting a um, coastal resilience index that is very similar to New York's. Um, we're customizing it a little bit for Pennsylvania, and we're also including some social vulnerability pieces from um, a, a Cleveland social vulnerability index. And so um, it's going to be, you know, pieces of these existing resources customized um, for use in Erie. And so what we're going to do is use the results um, that we get from step one, um, looking at those uh, greatest concerns, weather concerns and assets and using that to help um, develop this vulnerability assessment tool and then essentially going through and getting that score that Roy was talking about. And so that will help us determine what our priorities are and where the community is really lacking in resilience where we can we can focus our efforts. Next slide. So step three is to investigate options. And so what we're going to do um, once we have completed the vulnerability assessment is to conduct some scenario planning workshops with Gleesa. So they're gonna come in and help us do that. And ultimately what we're hoping after developing the scenarios, running through them, having um, discussions with community members is to really have an opportunity to consider what all uh, possible options are and um, action strategies. So really brainstorming and putting everything out on the table and having those conversations with the stakeholders and trying to figure out what might work best for Erie. Next slide. Um, and then um, finally, our, our next next steps are to prioritize, plan and take action. So um, once we have the information from the vulnerability assessments and the scenario planning, we're going to develop a best management practices guidance document that essentially essentially takes all of the prioritized information and develops a plan. Um, and one of the main things that we really wanted to do was not a plan that's going to sit on a shelf, but work to um, incorporate these action strategies with the community into existing plans and actions. And I think that's it. Next slide. Yes, that is all I have. So, um, of course, we're having discussion and information um, and questions after. So, um, but my information is there as well if anyone wanted to reach out. So, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. So, I am going. To... So, we have our last um, block of presentations that are going to be shared now. So, Megan Gass. Let me know when you're ready to go. I'm ready, Carolyn. Thank you. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Goss, and I serve as a Michigan Sea Grant Extension Educator in the Saginaw Bay region of Michigan. Next. To begin, I wanted to introduce you to our community of focus, Augre. Augre is a small coastal community connected to Lake Huron and a part of the Saginaw Bay watershed. This community has faced some challenges, including having US 23, a state route cut through the middle of town, 
and experiencing a changing food web in Lake Huron. At the same time, this community has opportunities, including a great connection to Saginaw Bay and its fishery, along with a long history of engaging K-12 students in Great Lakes literacy and stewardship. Also, a harbor of refuge previously managed by the Michigan Department of Natural Resources was in need of development along the River. Next. In 2015, Augre participated in the Sustainable Small Harbors Project with a focus on the former Harbor of Refuge. This integrated assessment research project was led by Dr. Don Carpenter, Lawrence Tech. It was funded by Michigan Sea Grant and Michigan's Office of the Great Lakes, now known as Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. And this project is a great example of the collaboration between University of Michigan and Michigan State University, as it involved Michigan Sea Grant Extension, Research, and Communication staff. This project supports placemaking and visioning for communities and their connected harbors. Next. Through a facilitated charrette process, including uh, using sticky dot voting, community members were able to share their thoughts and values for how all gray could develop the harbor of refuge moving forward. On the right, you can see the preferred alternate plan for the harbor and the downtown all gray that was developed. Next. So following the sustainable project, there was some delay in implementing the vision as the Harbor of Refuge ownership wasn't transferred to Augre until 2018. However, once that was done, the community began to quickly make their vision for the harbor into a reality. This once underdeveloped harbor, now named Riverside Park, has a fish cleaning station, pavilion for a farmer's market, a playground and splash pad, fishing piers, and a universally accessible kayak launch. I worked with the Augre City Manager on a grant proposal to support the installation of, installation of fishing piers and dark sky, dark sky quality lights. In total, the community has secured over $500,000 uh, from federal, tribal, state, and local sources to support the development of Riverside Park and Augre. Um, at the same time, all Gray Sim High School students have also supported Riverside Park's development by installing green infrastructure to support a more resilient harbor. Last year, they hosted a community visioning meeting about upgrades to Riverside Park, including a bioswale. They also uh, wrote a successful grant proposal to fund this project. And in this school year, the students were able to install the bioswale at the park. In the future, we hope that they'll also partner with us for developing some informational material at the park to help people learn more about impacts of bioswales. Next. Um, beyond the Sustainable Small Harbors Project, the Augre Watershed was a focus of the Tipping Point Planner Workshop in 2018. Augre was also a featured listening session in the Building an Equitable and Just Green Infrastructure Strategy for the North Central Region. Additionally, Augre completed a stormwater assessment with Huron Pines, a local um, nonprofit here in Northeast Michigan, to help better understand the infrastructure and drainage to make best recommendations for keeping pollution from running into lakes, streams, and untreated storm drains. This planning is vital as Augre faces a changing climate and a growing need for resilience. Earlier this year, Augre had over eight inches of rain in a 48 hour period. This extreme precipitation led to flooding and a federal disaster being declared in Aranac County. I now serve on the Aranac County Long-Term Recovery Group, where in addition to response and recovery, we focus on resilient strategies. Next. And a little early. So I hope you enjoyed <laughs> learning more about Augre and the Sustainable Small Harvest Project. If you'd like to learn any any if you'd like to learn more about this project, I will share a link in the chat to the Google slide of this presentation um, where you can check out some of the links and watch the video about the bioswale. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Okay, David Hart. Okay, I'm ready. You know, so again, my name is David Hart. I lead the extension program at uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant. You can go to the next. First thing that I'd like to do is uh, is introduce people because uh, the uh, outreach specialists in our field offices on the coast are the front line for resilience uh, in in uh, in our state. 
Um, Julia Nordyke, uh, uh, you know, uh, led the uh, uh, outreach uh, efforts for the NOAA Great Lakes Coastal Storms Program. Natalie Chin is up in Superior and has been working on a flood resilience scorecard and also co-chairs our Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts Tourism and Outdoor Recreation Working Group. Uh, Deidre Peroff is down in Milwaukee, our social scientist, and has been working with the local weather uh, service office uh, warning coordinator on how to get uh, warning messages uh, uh, better crafted for different kinds of communities. And Titus Seilheimer, our fisheries specialist in Manitowoc, has been working down in the Kenosha Dunes on a nature-based shoreline project. So next, we also have uh, outreach specialists based in Madison that have more of a statewide mission. Uh, Adam Beckley uh, continues a long uh, history of coastal engineering uh, outreach capabilities at Wisconsin Sea Grant. I've been on our state's coastal hazards work group for 25 years now. And then we even connect with our library and our education program to help with our resilience efforts. Next. So now I want to talk about three projects that Wisconsin Sea Grant's been involved with. Uh, the first one is the Southeast Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project, and that's uh, related to the fact that uh, Great Lakes water levels, the high water levels we've been experiencing, have been kind of a major problem that uh, have addressed our focus, like other programs within the region. Um, we worked on an integrated assessment uh, funded by the University of Michigan on Great Lakes water levels a few years ago, and that was the catalyst uh, for us to, uh, to begin working with 22 communities in southeastern Wisconsin on resilience. And Adam Beckley, our coastal engineer, uh, wrote a proposal to the NOAA Regional Coastal Resilience Grant and was successful, brought in $840,000 to our coastal management program back in 2017. And that's done a number of different things. It's allowed us to, uh, uh, to fund small grants in seven uh, municipalities. Uh, it also uh, helped uh, move forward a number of products, including a bluff owner, uh, homeowner's guide um, working on uh, how to assess um, structure that is vulnerable within small harbors and marinas. And we uh, adapted our own uh, uh, resilience self-assessment tool uh, from uh, the self-assessment tools that were done in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so, like many programs, we're seeing great value with going into communities with a self-assessment tool. Uh, so next, please. Um, that project um, has led to an effort to develop um, uh, more innovative nature-based shoreline practices to uh, to help to preserve the very rapidly eroding Kenosha dunes in southeastern Wisconsin. That slider at the top is just a little interactive slider if you were on the website and you can see just over a few years uh, how much uh, erosion has happened at the dunes. Uh, and the rehab project was funded by uh, the National Coastal Resilience Fund um, and NOAA uh, to look at um, underwater sills, uh, submerged sills, um, that could be uh, designed to help to re uh, reduce the waves that would be breaking on the shore and at the same time, possibilities for creating underwater habitat for fish species. Um, next, please. And then the last uh, project that I want to focus on is one that Julia Nordyke's been involved with, uh, with colleagues Kate Morgan and Julie Beth Hines. And that was identifying that codes and ordinances represent a major barrier to the implementation of green uh, infrastructure practices locally. And they came across, uh, Julia came across the presentation at the American Planning Association uh, Wisconsin chapter meeting a number of years ago that presented uh, an, an effort to, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to make the codes and barriers uh, a little easier to, to deal with. And a number of uh, our colleagues have worked with uh, uh, work with this particular document in order to be able to improve their, their uh, green infrastructure practices. Next, please. And just uh, to kind of hit home here, just wanted to talk that we do fund research as well as do outreach, and we've got a few high profile research projects, um, including one that has uh, been jointly funded with Indiana, Illinois Sea Grant and Michigan Sea Grant to have an integrated approach to looking at um, uh, hydrodynamics and nearshore sediment transfer uh, transport processes. And then next. 
And then I just want to end here that we also have some fellowships and student uh, experiences uh, in our resilience efforts as well, too. Um, we've, uh, we, we've got a number of fellows that are working on resilience projects, including a series of four at the, at the Coastal Management Program. And then I do have a link here if you want to dive in more deeply to our resilience projects that are is there on the slide as well, too. So thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Um, Sarah Orlando, let me know whenever you're ready. Hey, Carolyn, can you hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Orlando. I'm the program manager with the Ohio Clean Marinas program and, ex and an extension educator for Ohio Sea Grant. Um, so today, I just, with the time frame, wanted to focus on a single uh, tool that the Ohio Clean Marinas program developed as part of a multi-state, multi-sea grant uh, collaborative grant that's funded through the Great Lakes Protection Fund. Um, so this is actually this image on the slide here is a online stormwater toolkit website that I'm happy to say is is brand new and we're excited to share with you all. I'll uh, share the link in the chat box after my talk here. Um, this is this project is being led by Michigan Sea Grant um, in collaboration with Wisconsin Sea Grant, Ohio Sea Grant, and other project partners, including a stormwater management team at Ohio State, and. Um, what I'll share next is as part of this project, we wanted to put together educational resources on stormwater um, to help marinas with coastal resiliency. Um, and one of the goals was to help marinas learn about what uh, stormwater best management practices are that, that could be applied in a marina setting to help them understand what uh, stormwater practices such as green infrastructure could look like in a marina setting and then ultimately to give them the tools through education to help get them to hopefully building uh, some green infrastructure and stormwater best management practices on site. So I invite you if you have a, a smartphone to scan the QR code along with me um, if you enter the link, it does use quite a bit of bandwidth, so I wouldn't recommend that at this time, but save that link for later. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, if you have a smartphone, um, you'll actually be able to uh, take a look at this tool and test it out uh, with us. So next slide. What I'm sharing with you here today are a couple images from what we are calling the Ideal Clean Marina Virtual Reality Tour. So this was a um, tool developed specifically for this uh, Great Lakes Protection funded project um, that Ohio Clean Marinas in collaboration with Ohio Sea Grant and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources put together. And uh, we worked with Smith Group as a consultant on this project. We basically put together a uh, three-dimensional visualization tour, like a 360 tour, where if you're following along on your phone, you can literally walk around the room uh, moving your phone and it will move as if you are in the marina setting and you can look around um, and see some of the different best manager practices, environmental best manager practices uh, that we've incorporated into this uh, tool. So what I have here, if you click one more time, Carolyn, please. Thank you. Um, this is an example of one type of stormwater best manager practice specifically a disconnecting a downspout that then directs um, that stormwater runoff uh, or, or flooding in some cases for coastal resiliency into a, um, a bioswale or a native vegetated garden. And what we did is in this online tool, um, we have both simulated virtual reality, but then we've actually went ahead and taken drone footage, 360 degree video and still imagery from actual marinas in Ohio so that um, marinas, when they see this, can't just say, oh, you're showing me, you know, something simulated that isn't achievable. Well, we've actually populated it with images of marinas that have achieved some of these practices that we're recommending. Uh, next slide. I just have a couple screenshots here from the tool. Um, this is another angle of the marina. Um, here it's showing a gravel parking lot with some more native vegetation. Um, if you click one more time, Carolyn, it should pop up. Yes. And so this is actually a picture of, of a marina. Um, with a permeable pavement parking lot that's been installed in Ohio. Um, and actually there's some wetland and um, sustainable habitat uh, nearby, right next to the parking lot at the marina. Um, so next slide, please. 
Perfect. Um, so I wanted to just give you a quick taste of, of what we've put together here. Um, this is essentially phase one as part of this project. Um, we've incorporated a number of stormwater, specifically green infrastructure best manager practices in this ideal clean marina virtual reality tool. But the plan with Ohio and the Ohio Clean Marinas program is to actually build this out um, to include all of our environmental best manager practices from our clean marinas checklist in Ohio. Um, so over the next three to five years, we'll be adding uh, best manager practices on invasive species, a um, little bit more into the realm of coastal resiliency. I consider stormwater management as a core part of helping our marinas become more resilient, um, but we'll be adding some more uh, in that realm, as well as um, waste management, fuel management, and other common things that you may be familiar with um, as part of a, a typical clean marina certification. Um, so Scott Hardy and I, with Ohio Sea Grant are on this, thanks, Grant. We're on this project. Feel free to reach out to either of us to learn more. Um, I'd love feedback. Uh, feel free to check it out. If you have additional ideas or have input, uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah. And then finally, we have um, a tag team group from Car from Illinois Indian Sea Grant, Kara Salazar and Miles. And um, because they happen to know the organizer, they were like, we're not sure we want to do slides. So, um, uh, Kara, if you want to turn on your video and we need to, um, and let me know whenever you're ready to go, Kara. Thanks. Let me see if I can get this going. If you don't want to, that's fine. Too. It was just a little slow. So, I don't know if you my video. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Hi, everyone. I'm Kara Salazar. And can you hear me okay, Carolyn? Yes. Great. Yes. Um, and I'm with Purdue Extension and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. I'm an assistant program leader and extension specialist for sustainable communities. Uh, I focus on environmental planning, uh, natural resources, social science, and public engagement. And I have a couple of projects I'll share with you today as we are tag teaming. Um, our Rainscaping Education Program um, is an effort that provides rain garden training and resources for residential settings or small scale public spaces. Uh, I co chair this effort, and this was developed through uh, Purdue, the Purdue Extension side in 2013, and we've been running it um, since then, and it has 15 hours of uh, training for people to conduct rain gardens and, and includes tours and demonstration, the construction of a demonstration site. So we have a really nice network of communities that have gone through this site, uh, this program to date um, and leveraging our Purdue Extension staff. Um, in 2020, we adopted and expanded this effort through the University of Illinois Extension. So we now have grown that effort uh, across state lines. And then the next project I just am briefly mentioning, and I'm glad that I'm going last because it's nice to make some of the connections with the other projects that are up there and more mature. But in 2021, um, I'm working with some teams to develop and pilot new community technical assistance processes with planning, ordinance development and updates and targeted training and implementation support for green infrastructure. And so things we're looking at, um, we're going to, um, finalize a tool for green infrastructure optimization through tipping point planner uh, we're going to be working on integrating green infrastructure and hazard mitigation planning and looking at multifunctional green infrastructure co-locating with things like community gardens um, and looking at water capture too so there's some fun exciting things going on and i'm excited about um, learning more about some of the resilience planning too as as we're developing these so renee i'll hand it over to you Okay, great. Thanks, Kara. Um, so my name is Beanie Miles. I'm um, a communicator with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, green infrastructure, um, specifically related to work that one of our folks, Margaret Schneeman, um, our water resource uh, economist, she's been doing um, this work in the in the Calumet region. The Calumet region is located in the heavily um, urbanized uh, southern portion of Chicagoland and compared to the rest of the Chicago area, the Cayman region has uh, higher average unemployment, lower income, plus more flooding. So um, Margaret has been involved with the Cayman uh, Stormwater Collaborative, which is a group of government, businesses, and NGOs that have come together to try and address the flooding problem. 
um, in that work, she developed a needs assessment of um, green infrastructure workforce training, particularly maintenance training, because one problem with green infrastructure is that often the site is planted and then forgotten only to fail in a couple of years. So um, then the needs assessment results led to the development of a one day training um, aimed at um, those looking to enter the green infrastructure workforce, as well as those are um, uh, ongoing project managers. Um, and that training actually took place in the early part of the year, right before life ended as we know it. Um, uh, as so also as part of the co collaborative, uh, Margaret has been working with partners to provide opportunities for um, previously incarcerated persons to take part in training as well as green infrastructure contracts. So on a separate uh, project, um, Margaret has, is also part of the Calumet Soils project, which is a multi multidisciplinary research and outreach project funded by Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Um, it's led by a landscape architecture professor at the U of I and it's aimed at more intentional siting and designing of green infrastructure um, taking into account soil properties and other factors. Um, often green infrastructure is placed at a location that's not well considered and again fails after a couple of years. Um, the team has done, done, done soil testing and subsequent modeling, which has led, led to um, neighborhood designs for um, two pilot communities. One um, has submitted a grant proposal to try to do the installation of uh, the design. Um, the two de designs were actually developed by students in the landscape architecture class. Um, and one of them won an award at uh, a student award from the American Society of Landscape Architects. And then finally, because the work done in this project, as well as Ileana Brown's work um, at the U of I, Illinois Extension has awarded IISG a grant to create a comprehensive toolkit that can help Illinois communities throughout the state plan for design, modeling, implication, and maintenance of green infrastructure. Back to you, Carolyn. Thank you. You have five seconds left, so that was great. Okay. So um, huge, huge thanks to all of the presenters. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.